Welcome to Happy Path Programming. I'm Bruce Eckel. I'm James Ward. All right. Well, welcome back. It's been a while. I have yes, been traveling, you have. and so it's good to be back. And mm-hmm. um, and today we have with us Grace Jansen. And uh, I ran across uh, Grace's work. I don't think we've ever actually met in person. No, so I don't think we have. Great to see you, and hopefully we do cross paths at a conference sometime. Um, but I had seen you presenting about the 15-factor app, and maybe we'll get into that, uh, which fascinated me because I was at Heroku when Adam Wiggins wrote the 12-factor app and, and you said you helped I, a, li- a little bit of contribution uh bringing kind of the java perspective at the time to that and had you know suggested some some changes and stuff to that and i don't even remember it was a long time ago so i don't remember that but anyways so it's fascinated by your your kind of reinvigorating that that and adding some factors to it so maybe we'll get into that but mm-hmm. um but yeah welcome grace good to have you <laughs> Thanks so much for having me. It's great to join you guys. And yeah, hopefully at some point we'll meet face to face, but who knows? <laughs> yeah, when. I hope so. We'll get you up to Crested Butte for a, a conference sometime. So. Right. Oh, that sounds yeah, fun. The Winter Tech Forum. Yeah, that's <laughs> true. Yeah, I mean, since your employer pays for you to to come to these things, <laughs> yeah, we should uh, be fun. Yeah, definitely get you here. <laughs> yeah. So um, we uh, we've been trying to start with just hearing about what people's journey of interest is, not necessarily your companies you've worked for, but what are, tell, give us a, a, a picture of what you, what your journey of interest have been. Yeah. <laughs> and help us so, what kind of drew you into all this? Oh, that is a great question. Um, so I come from a slightly un, more unusual background where I didn't study comp sci or, or computer science or software engineering at university. I actually did biology Um, and then jumped into software engineering when I joined IBM. Um, I'd done a bit on the side, sort of bit of Python programming, uh, but mostly sort of um, functional programming, nothing object orientated. So it was a steep learning curve when I first jumped in uh, and was kind of a bit overwhelming coming in and realizing that, you know, this is huge language, this huge sort of ecosystem of different tools and technologies. Um, And, Coming in and realizing the language was older than me, I was like, oh, wow, there's a lot to learn. Um, This is intense. But uh, I kind of started out with literally just the basics of trying to understand not just Java, but also just the basics of where we were with um, sort of creating applications, cloud computing, et cetera. So I was really lucky that I had a mentor who was a, a senior technical staff member at IBM who I basically just, unbeknownst to him, dragged into mentoring me for a whole year um, (laughs) and sort of used that as my opportunity to ask all my stupid or not so stupid questions. So Um, let me ask. Yeah. So you graduated with a degree in biology and IBM goes, oh, you have a degree in biology. We'll just turn you into a computer scientist. Is that (laughs) what was there? Kind of, yeah. Okay. The great thing about IBM in terms of their hiring scheme is that it's not for that grad scheme anyway, it's not necessarily a, can you code? It's a, do you have the right mindset to learn to code? Huh. Um, and so I came in and, you know, they did ask me the obvious question of why would we hire you over a comp sci <laughs> student? Uh, and I think yeah. it's just the fact that it, it's, you know, I wasn't necessarily, I'd chosen something at the age of 18, like a course, and that was my life. Um, I was doing programming in my own time. Clearly it was a passion of mine and there were skills that I could bring that other people didn't necessarily have who hadn't done the same sort of stuff. So you were already dabbling in programming even though you were studying biology. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So I I was doing Python Python and stuff. To like solve some biological (laughs) thing or something. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I got the opportunity. It was a really cool module where we were using, we did one on statistical analysis in biology. So we're using R for that. Um, and then I did biological modeling uh, using Python. So I was modeling, vi- ironically, now with COVID, I was modeling virus spread through airlines huh. uh, and actually Whoa. modeling that system. Before so, COVID. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. So when COVID hit, I was like, oh, this was kind of predicted in a lot of the, uh, the research I was looking at. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Huh. It was really interesting. That's cool. So you were using some of the the mathematical libraries in Python and yeah, um, and in R, yeah, in a, in an R. Um, how what was your experience like learning Python from that side and <laughs> and using the 
Like, was it a lot of stack over? Like, what? Yeah, what was your? What did it? What was so it like? We got some basic, and I mean real basic, uh, introductions into more around the syntax of how to use Python, as opposed to where do you find libraries? Where do you find all these tools that you can use? Um, so that was a lot of just, if I'm honest, googling, um, googling, going to help forums. Uh, I was quite lucky that we had a couple of postdoc and PhD students who were there doing similar sort of stuff. Um, so I was able to collaborate with them and ask, you know, where do you get your data sets? What tools are you using? Um, and that helped a lot. But it reflecting back, my um, sort of the way that I was programming wasn't exactly best practice. It was more just sort of cobbled together to make it work, yeah. which is often how people start. Yeah, exactly. Copy and yeah. paste. Find well, something that it, works and copy yeah, and paste. Exactly. It. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, so that yeah. was sort of a very much a hands-on, just try it kind of approach. And I kind of just followed that through since. Um, huh. I've had a bit more structure in terms of that mentoring that I mentioned. But overall, yeah. I just kind of like getting hands-on and, and trying things. So you were intrigued by it and and wanted to you know go further with that, and so that was the yep. impetus to then go to IBM was it exactly. was kind of taking that further. Mm -hmm. Yeah, nice. yeah. So yeah, continue with your with your journey of interests and. <laughs> uh, yeah, so then I I jumped into the world of Java, and that was really okay. interesting. Um, and I ended up I can't even remember how I think we had a we just had within IBM a partnership happening with a company called Lightbend around reactive yeah he worked um, at lightbend <laughs> yeah yep back in his type um, safe yeah and it was really interesting i sort of took an interest in this new relationship that we had and this new product uh, a new sort of way of creating applications uh, and to me it just it really made sense because i think the way that my mindset is perhaps different to more traditional developers or perhaps people who have been in java for a long time is I have the advantage that I don't have what you might call baggage of how you originally did applications and how <laughs> right. you might have once done them years ago. Um, Bruce and so, I have a lot of Java baggage. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of things that you're used to. Um, yep. yeah, yeah, exactly. Mm. Just a mindset, I think, that that is hard to break out of objects. <laughs> well, that, yeah. I mean, because that comes from... C++ and then Java and then, well, and Python has objects and stuff like mm -hmm. that. But yeah. yeah, but really not questioning the, the value of that, mm. but rather parroting it. Oh yeah, you need encapsulation. It's like, why? Now we can ask why. Now we can ask why, because we see something contrasting. Yeah. And I think that's that's why I keep telling people, yeah, learn more than one language, because those contrasts will allow you to look more, well, critically at what you're doing in whatever language you're actually using. Yeah. And we're Very definitely true. seeing that with, okay, objects, when are they useful and when... Most of the time, maybe not, but sometimes, <laughs> yes. Yeah. It's like, well, okay, and now, now that that's, you know, whereas in Java, it's like, there's no question. It's mm. like, yeah, everything has to be an object because Smalltalk did it that way. But, yeah. but now we're going, oh, so when is it a good time to use objects? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, went into so, reactive. Okay, so what were you working on with Lightbend? Which which part of their... Uh, so we product? had a partnership where we had their reactive platform on our IBM okay. cloud. Uh, and I was actually building the Helm chart to be able to add that into um, our catalog, essentially, on the IBM cloud. Okay, um, so then you got into Kubernetes. <laughs> yeah, which, yeah. Oh, man, that seems oh, like that was for, interesting. for a biologist, like Kubernetes has got to be a, a, a bit wild. <laughs> yeah, especially because I had no idea about anything to do with like containerization or I didn't even know what a virtual machine was. You know, any of these concepts were brand new to me. Uh, yeah. I'll tell you what, actually, I found a, an amazing resource and it's a children's illustrated guide to Kubernetes. I don't know if you come that. across it's it. Yeah. It is so good. I would yeah. recommend that to anyone who has any grad intern who's not familiar with Kubernetes or containers, send them to that book. It's free online. And it's basically yeah. cartoon illustrations explaining Kubernetes. Yeah, I it's like great. cartoons. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Anything with cartoons, I'm there. That sounds like something that, because I know it's something to do with clustering. Right. 
<laughs> yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's all. I yeah, um, a system for managing a bunch of processes yeah. across a bunch of machines. Right. Okay. <laughs> Yep. Um, cool. So you're doing Helm charts and reactive stuff, mm-hmm. and they're they're uh, what, what was that called? The reactive um, platform. Reactive. Yes. Something reactive. Yeah. So yeah. it was the reactive platform. Yeah. Um, but I took kind of a an, a big interest in the overall sort of reactive manifesto and this kind of guiding principles of how to create what you'd call reactive applications. Yeah. Um, and I actually started comparing it to uh, biology, because huh. that's kind of just how my brain works. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I ended up doing a presentation actually at, at a couple of conferences around how we can see similarities between reactive architecture and beehives, which was oh, really wow. interesting. Yeah, oh, I've, that was a fun one. more about that. I'm, I'm fascinated <laughs> yeah. And this fits with, we were just talking about Conway's Law. And so it oh, seems yeah, yeah. like this fits with that. Huh. Conway's no. law and beehives? Well, no, it's just ultimately we're biological <laughs> systems. Oh. And so mm-hmm. maybe our software should look like that rather yes. than like hierarchical systems. Huh. I, I am always trying to compare biology to software because I feel like biology has literally had like centuries to evolve and get this right. So we should maybe be mimicking that a bit more in terms of like how we design or build our software. Um, and and by there's so many. You mean millions of years? Sorry, millions. Of, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, in terms of like, long, long yeah, the, the the similarities. There's just so much we could learn from it and use. Mm-hmm. Like all of the algorithms that we use come from inspirations in, or well, not all, but a lot of them come from inspirations in nature. It's amazing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, it would make a lot of sense. Tell me more about the beehive reactive correlation, if you remember it. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So. Um, it was all about sort of, so the, the reactive manifesto is based on four key behaviors. Um, it's underlying, it is um, an event-based sort of asynchronous messaging backbone. Um, and then the sort of characteristics that that enables is um, high resiliency uh, and also elasticity. Uh, in elasticity being not just scaling up, but also being able to scale back down dynamically, depending mm. on sort of workload. Uh, and then that leading to responsiveness which is essentially what we want our applications to be, responsive to events that are occurring. Hmm. Um, And so these characteristics were actually characteristics that bees already have and that bees already do. Um, And it was just this sort of comparison between things like uh, bees have this amazing ability that they each bee has a role in the hive. So you might be a guard bee or uh, you might be a worker bee. Uh, They even have air conditioning bees. I was like, that's amazing um, to keep airflow through the hive. Right. And when the hive is under attack, they can dynamically change roles. So more of them can become guard bees to essentially deal with that load on the system. Um, huh. And then they can dynamically change back again. Ooh, that's so, like actors in the become. <laughs> or exactly. <threat>. Yeah. <laughs> All yeah. about like resource allocation and ensuring Ooh. that you, you know, are dealing with the load in your system appropriately. So it can remain responsive. So yeah, it was kind of analogies oh. like that that I was drawing. That's really cool. Mm-hmm. So teaching people the reactive manifesto, but correlating using to bees, using bees. Yeah, I like it. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. I just no, find like that it. sometimes these concepts are so abstract yes. that sometimes it can be hard to either relate to or remember. Whereas when you tie it to something concrete, that people are like, yeah, like everyone kind of knows about bees. Um, yeah. it's a bit easier to remember. Okay, I have a challenge for you. Uh, yeah. What's the biological analogy of a monad? <laughs> Might as well. Man, if Grace can do that for us, oh, we will. Yes, we will. Uh, just, we're not worthy. Give you some time on that one, I think. <laughs> yeah. Well, as a testament to your relating this to biology, I we had asked you to describe this and you and you were able to recall the four elements of the reactive manifesto just like off the top of your head, which I think does speak to your correlation to biology allowed you to remember it much more firmly. Um, mm. I was working at, at TypeSafe then, now Lightbend, uh, when they wrote the reactive manifesto yeah. and, and I could not recall the four <laughs> pillars of it off the top of my head like you just did. So Yeah, impressive. well, it's kind of like uh, you might be familiar with the idea of a, um, a memory palace. Yes. Yeah. Yes, going you know in the and, the rooms. and it's like, well, and if you're doing the thing with bees, you're, you're able to attach that and then you're 
yeah, it's easy to, to huh. remember to that. To recall. So. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Cool. So you were yeah, doing Reactive stuff. Platform yep. and uh, and Java. So then you you went from Python to Java and had to learn yes. Java. Yeah. And uh, and then learn Reactive and learn Kubernetes and Helm and yeah. like my there's a lot of stuff that you. It had was a to, lot at once. <laughs> yeah, a lot of pieces with a I lot think... of like foundational elements that you had to mm. learn all at once. Um, what was it like going from Python to Java? It was. Um, as I said, it was overwhelming at first because I came in and saw, you know, that the team that I joined had a product that was, um, so WebSphere has been around for like 25 years and it's still something that's actively developed on. And that's the department that I joined at the time. Um, and although we had things like Liberty and Open Liberty, which are newer, um, offerings and technologies, I looked at things like the product and the language and a lot of the people at IBM are there for very long careers. And I joined thinking, how am I going to add anything to this as a biology mm. graduate? And so it was a bit overwhelming, but I think what helped was kind of having conversations with some of the colleagues around me and realizing that not a single one of them knew everything. And that kind of gave me this sort of sense of, I just need to focus on one particular area and go, you know, really learn that. And then I can move on to another and learn that and sort of take it one chunk at a time rather than trying to learn everything at once. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and that mentality really helped. Mm -hmm. So in, that, in particular, your focus with that was reactive and yep. the Helm pieces to that's that. That's where I started. Yeah. yeah. Nice. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. That's a good, <laughs> pretty, uh, pretty amazing place to start because there's not very many people that know, I think, both of those Con both of those technologies and well concepts. and i bet i mean my background's in physics and then later engineering and so uh and i feel like the science the struggling with science part of it ended up being really helpful whereas you know computer science programming can be seen as oh well you know some smart people made these decisions about <laughs> how a language should work yep. and who am i to question that's just set in stone <laughs> right yep hmm. and the number of you, times you, the number of times that. yeah exactly i used to ask why and i didn't realize i was asking why so much and huh. all of the guys who'd been there for like 20 plus years were like you ask why a lot huh. I was like do i huh. they said it's a good thing it's great mm -hmm. like that we need to ask that's why a scientist more. mind yeah right yeah yeah and then at some point you realize wait a minute these language designers were just making this up. They thought it was a good idea, but they didn't know. Yep. Yeah. So, they weren't asking why. <laughs> maybe not enough. <laughs> or they yeah. were asking why in the context of where they were coming yeah. from. You know. Yeah, the information they had, right? Because that changes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> but they could go down a rabbit hole. Uh, <laughs> and we have seen that happen. Yep. Yeah. And and not ask why. This was I guess the the one of the cool things about Elm we've talked, we bring up Elm sometimes the mm -hmm. programming language uh, is that when when a, a bunch of people had asked the Elm language designer to add type classes to it, he just kept asking why. <laughs> and <laughs> maybe he has a science background. That'd be interesting to know if, if he does. But but he he just kept asking why 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 and no one was ever able to quite describe to him the why for type classes. Because oh, type classes are good. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, because <laughs> Haskell has type classes, so right. obviously. And if, you're, <laughs> if you're doing Haskell. Well, and um, uh, the guy who's developing Rock, when uh -huh. he said, oh, um, currying. Yeah, we don't need currying. Yeah. I was like, wait, I thought you had to have currying. Yeah. Yeah, that was a really... And he he came out of the Elm world as yeah, well. He, interestingly. Yeah, interestingly. So maybe there is a connection between Elm mm -hmm. and asking why. <laughs> <laughs> maybe they're all taught to. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so. Yeah. Good to ask why, and when ask why from the from a general perspective, which I think maybe that's kind of the science side. Well, there is a thing. There's a practice called I think it's five whys or something mm. like that, and you just keep asking why and drill down you know, at each time. And if you don't hit five, then you're not doing it hard enough or something like that. Is that yeah. something from science? Uh, general? I don't know. I think it's just like a okay. general practice, like huh. you know, Occam's razor or something, yeah. okay. but more recent. 
Yeah. So, so you you eventually get to the Y YAML. <laughs> <laughs> It was a, yeah, it was a challenging uh, piece of work that we were doing, especially because we had, you know, it was a third party um, service that we were offering on an internal cloud. And so yeah. often it would, both sides would change and we didn't know when they were changing or if they were changing. So our YAML would have to change. So yeah, yeah. it was, it was definitely a learning curve for me in terms of not just Helm and YAML and all the, and Kubernetes and all the rest of it, but also working with external developers not just internal developers as well which is something i think more and more developers are having to get used to as well because of open source exactly yeah open source collaboration uh, partnerships it's i think it's a lot more collaborative now than it ever has been in the past between companies that's true yeah that's we no single vendor can provide everything that you need anymore whereas even like ibm very historically was like we're an ibm shop right and Mm -hmm. ibm gives us everything that we need and so then you don't have to collaborate with the outside world because you have this closed ecosystem microsoft was that yeah microsoft was that model as well and yeah the world doesn't work that like that anymore it's not possible to be a closed ecosystem do the kinds of things that we're trying to do unless you involve as many people as possible i know? feel like there's a biology connection here oh yeah, <laughs> for sure probably for somewhere sure. along the lines i don't yeah. know if it's bees again or <laughs> all of biology Something like a hive mindset you know yeah because <laughs> yeah, it's well because it seems like there's a lot of people who are able to look at i i just i mean there's some really brilliant designs in open source python libraries mm-hmm. and there are these people who can look at a problem and they go, oh, I see how to make this clear to everybody. And they design a library and it's just brilliant. And it just, it's obvious to use and it does everything you need to use. I don't know. I'm just amazed when, when there's, and it's yeah. like, how did that person achieve that huh. clarity? You see of that. Thinking? Yeah. Huh. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. And so um, you said you started speaking around, 2018 what drew you into that (laughs) so uh i had a couple of colleagues who were actually already speaking at conferences um so steve pool uh who now works at sonotype um and there were a couple of others like holly cummins who is now Mm. at red hat um so they i was quite lucky that they were kind of in my circle of influence within ibm um and so i got invited by holly and steve to come along to the ljc Uh, because they were having an event for first-time speakers. So that was really cool. It was like a speaker clinic. So we went uh, and we were all invited to present a five-minute presentation on anything we wanted. And then we'd get feedback from the mentors that were there. And then we'd give it again and they'd record it so that we could then submit it to conferences Hmm. going forward. Um, So it it was a great experience. I would recommend that kind of thing to anyone uh, who's interested in starting to speak. Huh. Well, yeah. That's cool. That is really nice. I, I did a similar training at Adobe. It was, and mm-hmm. I remember I was, it was so terrible. I was just, <laughs> it was just embarrassing. If the recording of that exists, like that'd be blackmail material for me. It, it was here's such, how bad you were. Yeah. Here's how bad I was. Yeah. yeah. No, I just, I just somehow jumped into the deep end and I don't know how bad I was at first. I'm sure there was <laughs> some of that. Yeah. I was awful when I first started speaking. Mm-hmm. Uh, my first presentation was when I was in school and I was presenting at, my mom's a primary school teacher and I was presenting at her uh, primary school, which I think is maybe middle school for you guys. Um, okay. So kind of young. Um, yeah. And then, yeah, I finished the presentation. She walked up to me. She was like, I love you, but that was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> okay, fair. <laughs> Um, but I after a lot of practice, it's gotten better. Not so much pressure to fail with a bunch of small kids. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It didn't matter too much. Yeah. <laughs> I I presented about technology to a bunch of third graders a few years ago. And uh, it, you probably only... lost them right away. Huh? Oh, I'm, yeah. <laughs> let me explain let me category explain theory to you. <laughs> Let's start with category theory, kids. Yeah, because otherwise... Cause... None of this makes sense. I did like a little presentation. The only thing I remember is that after my presentation, one of the kids, we do Q&A, and one of the kids raises their hands and says, uh, what viral game did you create? And I'm like, 
okay. So this is what third graders care about with programming is is what viral game we, we could create. Did you make Angry Birds? Yes or no? <laughs> right. Exactly. That's what they want to know. Yeah. Um, so, okay. So you, uh, you, let's see, where, where are we at in your journey? You, uh, you were doing Kubernetes, Java, yep. reactive stuff and, mm -hmm. and presenting on, on those as well yeah. or, or. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Presenting yeah. on those. That, that was actually my first presentation at JFocus in Sweden. Oh, um, nice. All about reactive and bees. Um, so yeah. that's kind of where it got started. <laughs> Yeah, I like it. Cool. <laughs> yeah, J Focus um, is is great because you know um, the audience doesn't seem to convey live any any feedback in terms of if they're liking it or hating it. You just it's have just no blank. Idea. Yeah, just yeah. blank. Yeah, yeah. I yeah, did get so that warning before I went in. They were yeah. like, you know, just keep going. Yeah, yeah, a lot of countries in the northern part of of Europe tend to be that way. And they, exp I, I remember the first time I gave a presentation in, I don't know if it's Norway or Sweden or one of those places. And everybody was just, yeah, you got zero feedback. And I asked somebody about that and they go, oh no, we're trained to just listen raptly. <laughs> and you go, well, yeah, that's what you guys were doing. It was you just it like, excellently. totally no, nothing back. <laughs> So then what was next? What, so what then after that, uh, I kind of got interested in more of the open source sort of um, community. So looking at, I was I was helping to, uh, I was actually utilizing Open Liberty uh, as part of my demos for the reactive stuff. So looking at that and then also looking at things like MicroProfile, Jakar TE. Um, I then dabbled in a bit of test containers for a little bit. Um, oh, nice. And yeah. then, yeah, I've been focusing a lot recently on, on MicroProfile and and sort of higher level stuff like methodologies. So I branched out into lots of different directions afterwards. Yeah. Yeah. So what's been some interest highlights? Ooh, uh, test way. containers was really interesting because I'd not come across some, it, it just, again, it was one of those things where I looked at it and went, well, why wasn't this a thing before? Like this makes <laughs> right. sense. Yeah. Um, it's one of those obvious, but not obvious innovations, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Well, and so and that bringing was really it back to biology, isn't what you would always desire in biology is the ability to easily create a reproducible environment that you could run tests against. <laughs> yeah, and one that's as close as possible to what you want to actually create, right? That's right. Um, yeah, exactly. So, you know, making human cells in a lab or whether it's, you know, um, testing it on human clinical trials, we're always trying to get it as close as possible to the real thing. Yeah. Um and Which we, just, again, we haven't figured out how to do that in parallel universes yet. And so <laughs> and not until quite. we have yeah. But if it's too hard, we'll just use male mice. Because <laughs> yeah. the, you know the the cycles of the female mice mess up our data. <laughs> that's a thing. Oh, absolutely that's huh. a yeah, thing. Yeah. Huh. yeah. Oh, right. And then when then when they actually deliver the drug to the human population, they, they haven't, haven't tested it. No, females. and so it's like, well, but you know. That would be hard. So we won't do that. <laughs> oh, it's crazy. Too challenging. Um, and so when you started looking at methodologies, mm -hmm. like you, you were looking for something higher level, you know, some way, how can we think about these things in bigger terms? Yeah, exactly. Because and it was so... That what, yeah. Oh, go ahead. Is that what led you to the to modifying the, the 12 factor model? <laughs> yeah. So it was, it was definitely... I, I just wanted to know if someone's trying to either modernize an application or make a new application, how on earth do they know what steps they should be taking to actually make an application that's going to be effective on the cloud? Um, especially because that underlying infrastructure changes has changed so much, but also changes so frequently um, in the current sort of state of or rate of innovation. Yeah. Um, and so I ended up stumbling across the uh, 12 factor app methodology, which I found really interesting. Um, and there, there's loads of different case studies out there that have utilized this quite effectively. And the thing that drew me to it was the fact that it was language agnostic, language agnostic, tool agnostic, platform agnostic, the fact that anyone could use it, which I thought was great. So you're talking about general software design rather than design using Java or what? Exactly. These tools. Yeah. Yeah. Because you, because I think you, 
you probably at some point got exposed to the gang of four patterns and those aren't about deployment and it really, yeah. but, uh, and then you probably also got exposed to in Java EE, the like deployment profile and, and all that kind of like uh, that whole side of it. Um, yeah. And things like so, the cloud native uh, trail map, that was another interesting one, but uh, it was very focused on sort of tools as opposed to more general architecture styles, methodologies, um, but there's some, there's some great sort of toolkits that you can use out there, but I just really resonated with the, with the 12 factor one. Um, and I, I have to say, I can't take any credit for the extension to the 15 factor. Um, that was Kevin Hoffman from Dynatrace. Okay. Uh, I stumbled across his book. He had a short, uh, book on it. I think huh. from O'Reilly, uh, okay. you can access it online okay. if you're interested, uh, oh, cool. but he then extended it to the 15 factors. And yeah, again, a lot of the things that he added was, again, one of those obvious, why didn't we have this before? Um, that I was like, yeah, this makes sense. Bruce and I were at coffee this morning and talking about 12 factor. And so Bruce was asking me about some of them. And and every time I came up with one, it was just like, oh, yeah. And that seems totally obvious today. And yeah. so I was like, but when Adam wrote 12 factors, like all of it was very foreign to most people. Mm. And it's I guess that's a it's a good sign when you've defined something that now just seems obvious and like yes. test containers too. It's like, mm -hmm. it just seems obvious and exactly. Yeah. But, it, but there was a time when it wasn't. <laughs> well, it was new water to be swimming in. Yeah. Yeah. And so people, you know, didn't know, well, what's, what is the background that eventually we're not going to even pay attention to and what are the actual diff everything was hard. Yeah. So, mm -hmm but somebody has to come up with it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Right, right. So what resonated for you with the 12 or 15 factors? What was what stood out? What was different? What was what yeah, what was so interesting about it? The so starting with the 12 factors, I liked the fact that it took you right from, you know, getting started with that one code base, um, you know, where you store that, are you using things like git repositories, etc. So starting right from the very basics of that application and going all the way through to behaviors and characteristics that you'd need in production. Um, so all the way through from sort of the creation stage to the edit stage to the deploy stage to the sort of monitoring stage. Um, yeah. I like the fact that it had characteristics that covered all of those bases huh. right end to end, really. Yeah, and I guess... It from your your journey through technology, you needed to kind of be told kind of more prescriptively, like yep. here's the start to end, the whole picture versus yeah. just, you know, it, that was more useful than, than just a particular piece. Exactly. So the 12 factors actually start with, uh, you're using a GitHub repository. I mean, you're using a, a distributed repository. They it's actually more about, uh, so the first factor is code base. In fact, you can probably give this better than I can, knowing that you were involved I in the I don't creation. remember. I don't have a <laughs> recollection of all of them. Um, so the first one is code base. So it's more around like looking at the fact that you should have one single source of truth. You should have that one code base from which you can then deploy different uh, versions of that application, for example. Um, also looking at where you store that code base. So utilizing shared repositories, whether that be Git or GitLab or whatever you might be using, Gitbucket, you know, there's tons of them out there. Um, but being able to have that shared single source of truth, not just one that's, say, locally on your own machine. Um, so that's kind of, of, I think, the intention. Have, a lot of these have, have value in the in the contrast, which is like how we did things before before mm -hmm. this. So in this case, the contrast is there is a number of, people in the world of technology who would in their on their machine in eclipse create a war file and copy that war file up to a server and this factor is saying no like your your deployment artifact should should be a a product of some um automated build process. automated it, well i think we will get into the automated mm -hmm. piece of it but you start with your source code as being the thing that is the, the source of truth for how mm. you get to a deployment. Yep. And so, yeah, and I'm, I was speaking to myself about <laughs> creating war files. Oh, you did my, that? I, oh, yes, I did that. It got <laughs> even worse, but we won't go into um, <laughs> yeah. the, the worst Your shame. Parts. Yeah, the shame. 
how I did things before 12 factor, <laughs> before the world of 12 factors. Yeah. So, okay. So go, going back, um, we've got the code base, the, the single mm -hmm. source of truth that is shareable, that is um, ultimately can result in a deployable. Artifact. And I would think there would be something about build automation and automated testing in that yep, as well. There's parts in there. So, but they come under different factors, I would say. Right. Um, right. So things like, uh, for example, there's one called build, release, run. That's one of the factors. I think it's factor number five from what I remember. Um, and it's, it's essentially all about having these kind of like strictly separate sections. So like building it, then releasing it, then running it, but having some kind of pipeline that takes you through each of those separate um, sort of processes, I guess, or stages. Um, and so actually in the 15 factor app methodology, that's extended to also include uh, the design stage as well. So going right from design all the way through and having that pipeline. Um, huh. So yeah, it's, it's, it, that kind of is part of that automation that how can we automate going through them, but still keep them as separate stages. So one of the things I notice is that um, the pragmatic programmer book, yep. they, and Barry Hawkins is the one who first pointed this out to me. He said that like, if you go in and you're trying to teach somebody agile or, you know, some, whatever higher development process and, and they don't have uh, you know, some sort of re repository, uh, automated testing, automated build. He goes, well, that's, you can't go any further unless you have those three as, as in the, in your foundation. Um, yeah, it's pointless because you yeah. can't do refactoring, for example, unless you have those things. And reliably, uh, reliably. well, yeah, I mean, <laughs> you can, you can, yeah. And so, I mean, and it's interesting that, well, or obvious that they would incorporate those here. I, I think the pragmatic programmer existed before this happened. I'm pretty I sure. So. Pretty and old, I've never but, read, read that. So I don't, yeah. know, I don't know too much about it, but mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. So, so the, the kind of the life cycle of how you get reliably get from your source code, the first factor to, mm -hmm. to something runnable and yep. do that in a repeatable, <laughs> reliable way. way. Yeah. 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 yeah, exactly. And then it also goes through to other things like, for example, um, things like dev prod parity, which is an interesting one. Um, and that's sort of one that again was extended in the 15 fact out methodology to be just environmental parity, sort of just making it a bit broader because we don't just have dev and prod now. We normally mm -hmm. have you know either staging, QA, testing, um, DevSecOps, e any of these environments. So ensuring that that parity part really is just meaning like ensuring that they're as similar as possible so that when it, this is coming back to test containers, right? When we're testing, we want to be testing or developing or staging in an environment that's as close to production as possible. Um, so ensuring that parity exists. Which sounds obvious when you it say it. Does. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But and yet, you know, when you think back so to the way you might have done before. it. Yeah, exactly. You probably were using, I don't know, like a really lightweight thing on your development machine versus a really, you know, strong and reliable uh, something else technology on your production. Yeah. And that kind of made sense at the time. But when you think about it, yeah, it's probably going to be issues in terms of parity between them and errors that you might be getting in each production, in each environment. Uh, so, yeah, it. it Seems obvious, but also wasn't obvious. Yeah, yeah. Back uh, since you're you're an IBMer, you'll probably understand this. But back in the day, uh, I was using WebSphere. Was it WebSphere? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the IBM one, right? Yeah. <laughs> but I always get WebSphere and WebLogic mixed up. WebLogic was BAs, <laughs> then bought by Oracle. Anyways, so using WebSphere, and that was what we had to use in production because mm. you know with the the executives decided that was what we were going to use and but none of the developers wanted to run web Sphere on their machines because the machines weren't powerful enough to do that yeah. and so we would use jboss on our local machines for mm. development mm. and then create our war files and hope that they would run correctly in web Sphere. and usually they did but not always <laughs> yeah it's the hope so this is, yeah so this is a place <laughs> where we did not have good dev prod parody hope is a strategy it's not a good one <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. but it's one you can still use <laughs> <laughs> that's right <laughs> just go <laughs> cross your fingers, cross your fingers. <laughs> yeah. um did you find any biological correlation with the 15 factor app um 
methodology me- methodology <laughs> methodology uh, i didn't find too many mostly because I, there are some at the individual factor level so uh for example like um ensuring things like disposability containers can be a really great way of doing that because you can just spin them up uh, take them down quite quite easily um and so do you I, use the uh, cattle, not pets? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which is a biological great one. metaphor. For oh, I hadn't exactly. heard that one. Oh, give us that one, Grace. Tell, tell Bruce. So about that that's all about kind of. Uh, so as humans, there is a big difference between the way we treat something like cattle versus the way we treat our pet cat, Carl, for example. <laughs> like we give Carl a name, we nurse Carl back to health because we love him. He's our pet. He's irreplaceable. Um, And yet cattle, on the other hand, like if one of them were to get TB, for example, which is quite common, generally we'll just sort of cull the herd, so to speak, um, and buy a new one, which is kind of the mindset we need to have when we are introducing the the various elements of our applications, because we need to be in the mindset of cattle of, well, if they need to go, they need to go. Um, We need to be replacing them dynamically to make sure that performance stays performant um, rather than... In Waiting. writing, where they say "kill your darlings," <laughs> <laughs> sounds this makes me think of that. It just means none of your writing is so precious that you can't just pull it, it out, out and throw it away. Yeah, exactly. So, again, contrasted to the way we used to do things, which was I would have a server, and uh, that server was it had a name, and that <laughs> server was irreplaceable like Mm -hmm. if that server died like oh my god like everything is gone and that's the end of the world and the server had history and the server had history Mm. all these things that we did to it to get it into the state that it it was in and who knows all of the scripts that i ran and all of the commands that i ran and all the things i installed and you know getting that getting another machine back to that state is impossible and so that had a lot of downsides to to uh because you know what servers did die yeah. and then it was then i would spend my uh christmas holiday fixing oh, a server gosh. in the data center and that is not a good way to live uh, especially <laughs> in the cloud where things are less reliable ultimately, yeah. like the individual pieces are less reliable generally in the cloud and so that just no longer really worked in the cloud <laughs> i had a friend who worked at oracle f- for a while and to the first thing that he had to do and it was expected to take weeks was to actually build the code set up his machine to build the code base and it took weeks and he said you know sometimes artifacts would just disappear you know parts of it and the engineers would say oh yeah that's called build lossage (laughs) it was just an expected thing that stuff would randomly disappear uh, this was years ago, so I I hope they're better now. But boy, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> random disappearing. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, and it was very hard to provision new servers. Well, but, yeah, it, you had to go, you know, do a pr- procurement request, and you know they would then go to Dell or whoever and order a bunch of servers, and uh, and then they'd have to then provision the servers, the operating system. Anyways, it would take you know, you months to, and months. Because you had to run your own machine. Exactly. And, right. and then, so who was the, what was the breakthrough where we suddenly got to the point where we could go, oh, cloud, please give me a server. When did that happen? Who, who was that? Yeah. Before I joined. Uh, Amazon was, Amazon, Amazon was really the, the, mm. the first one who, who, uh, made that idea more masses centric. Mm-hmm. I'm sure that it existed in various mm-hmm. places. There were people kind of doing that concept, but Amazon was the, the first place. And I remember when I moved from a physical server that I no longer had to keep running and you know pray that it wouldn't die to an Amazon virtual server. And oh my God, it was so much better. And, <laughs> and of course, like the physical machine that that was on probably was replaced in its life many times, mm-hmm. but the virtual mm-hmm. machine, you know, Mm-hmm. was restarted and you know run in multiple places my brother had my web server on he he had to get a t1 into his garage and he ran my server when i was giving away thinking in java for free to get people to come to seminars and it and so we had to i don't know i think i was paying a thousand dollars a month for a t1 line yeah and whatever it cost to the server and then his time and it's like you think about what we're able to do now for a mm. few cents 
you can have a server yeah. in the cloud and it's just there reliable and don't have to worry yeah. about whether todd's you know power gets cut or anything yeah. like that yeah it's amazing amazing it's but we did have it. to have a different a different mindset mm -hmm. around mm -hmm. this um, which is the disposability, which is talking about yeah. is like treating our servers like cattle, not like pets. And that was a big shift. Like that took, that took many, many years to, to shift us. And it has also had an impact in how we architect our applications because mm -hmm. we can no longer architect assuming that, that, that our cache is always going to be, you know, um, hydrated and, you know, just, yeah. Well, and we also think about CPU time. I mean, you know, the whole Lambda idea of, of you know, programming so that it uses as little, it doesn't keep anything running if, if you can in yeah. the background while it's not being used. Yeah. Yeah. That's, we didn't worry about that before. It was right. like, mm -hmm. no, it's my machine. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's been a big mind else on, on 15 factor yeah. apps that, that yeah, what stands out the other things. Yeah. Well, the, the thing that I was, I think most surprised about in terms of the difference between 12 factor and 15 factor was that in the 12 factor, there was basically no real shout out to security. So I was like, huh. Whoa, um, yeah. that's a big like surprise. Again, it's one of those obvious non obviouses, um, if you know what I mean. So yeah. in the 15 factor app, they added in a factor called um, authentication and authorization, which was essentially their call out to security. So in some way or another, ensuring that people are A, authorized and have the right authority level um, to be able to access that particular service, uh, create that particular request, et cetera. Um, so I, I think that was an important addition um, in terms of adding that to those factors. And that's just about the securing the essentially data application, um, not so much on securing the the um, like from developer. Like it's not about the pro the production DevOps kind of no exactly security yeah. side of things. Like what's the, what's the new term for that DevSecOps or something? Yeah, or DevSecOps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Problem. <laughs> I don't know about DevSecOps. There's a lot of them. <laughs> yeah. What's what it, what's the what's that concept DevSecOps? So I think it's about uh, combining the fact that it's like an, essentially an extended form of DevOps. So the fact that as developers, we're no longer just doing development and we have a separate operations team. We are now expected to do a, a bit of both, a bit of everything, um, doing both the deployment as well as the development initially um, and having that as, as a combined cycle uh, as a development process. Um, and DevSecOps is essentially bringing in security into that as well. So understanding that, we can't just rely on an external magical security team anymore. We have to be thinking about that in our design and our development process and continuing to do that as well in that development cycle. Huh. That makes sense to me. It does seem like there's a lot of things that the developers need to be thinking about while they're, while they're writing code. I mean, that's it. I think this came from back when I was getting started, there was a big push to just make programmers more productive. And there was, not, you know, I guess there were a lot of assumptions that, oh, well, and of course the code will work fine. <laughs> All we need to do is produce more of it. Yeah. And, yeah. um, and I see that still in our culture. It's like, it's about productivity. It's not about reliability. Huh. I think that's a big shift that's happened. I would say fairly recently because I came in and when I came into IBM, we had like a, a, a dev camp or essentially we don't start directly in our product. We go and we work on some other side project uh, and we're essentially taught best practices right from the get-go so that when we then join our teams, we hopefully bring those best practices with us and encourage those into the more, I would say, ingrained processes that are perhaps part of uh, traditional product life cycles. Um, so things like, for example, pair programming, uh, things like software craftsmanship. There was, a, there was a phrase that our tutor taught us where he was like, anybody can write code. He said, not anybody can write readable code. He was like, you should be, you know, readable, deployable, maintainable. Um, he was like, you, anyone can copy and paste from Stack Overflow. It's about being an engineer, making the best possible class or whatever you need to make uh, to make that as effective as possible. So we were quite lucky that that was really encouraged from the get-go in terms of our education in that sense. 
Hmm. Yeah, I like that idea because, well, once again, the uh, you were working on a side project, so it was yeah. a cow. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, Doesn't and matter you could learn the things using the cow rather than working on your your thing that was going to be your core project. And yeah. Discover, learn, going through that learning process on live code. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that yeah, makes exactly. a lot of sense. So where are you at in terms of interest now? What's, yeah. what's, uh, what's top of <laughs> so mind for you? I'm uh, At the moment, I'm delving into more around developer tooling. Um, hmm. So I've been looking at things like language servers. Um, uh, we've got some language servers that we've made for MicroProfile and Jakarta EE. Uh, things like Piquito, which is like build packs, essentially. Um, mm-hmm. And other things like utilizing... Because I was new to the world of IDEs. And I had this naive assumption, I should admit that I just go in and I just use the IDE. And then I got introduced to this magical world of plugins and extensions. And it was like, whoa, I can be way more effective and productive. And, you know, I make fewer mistakes and enable code generation and all this kind of stuff. So yeah, delving into that world at the moment and how we can enable developers to be a bit more effective with their time, like you say, productivity without compromising on that code quality um, and sort of maximizing the use of their time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Have you been exploring like GitHub Copilot at all? No, I haven't. No. What's that about? Oh, that uses, it, it might be a problem within IBM. I'm not sure, but um, because we've, we've encountered other companies that where they're going, oh, we can't have this. It, what it is, is it looks through the whole, anything that's open source in GitHub mm-hmm. and it's using machine learning to when you say, "Oh, I'm starting to type this," you know, a function, say compare or whatever. It goes, "Oh, yep. I, I think I know what you're doing," and it fills the code in for you. Oh wow, that's cool! Like oh, auto generating it is. Code. It's yeah. yes, but it's from it's from looking at you know hundreds or thousands of of code examples of mm. this, and so it can actually kind of fill your code in, and you go, oh yeah, well, let's I'll put that in and maybe make some modifications to it or whatever. Oh, it's mind blowing. That's amazing. It's like, yeah, a, experiment with that if you get the chance, because it's like, oh, this is a different world. It's almost like basically an automatic connection to Stack Overflow. So instead of going and looking stuff up, <laughs> it's going out. Oh, here's what you need. I know. I'll I know what this is. So it's you know people are going, oh, is it's it's going to replace programmers like some of these other technologies? No. No, it's, you know, Stack Overflow doesn't replace programmers. You still have to, <laughs> you, you have to understand years. what you're putting in. Yeah. So I'm a bit of a curmudgeon with a lot of this stuff where I often am like, yeah, I'm, I don't need that. You know, I, I don't need the tool helping me. I can do it myself. And so I was, for a long time, I wrote code in VI. And it was the same kind of mentality. It was like, I don't need the tool to help me. I'm good enough. You know, <laughs> me and too. Didn't want to be faced with the idea that I needed help, you know. Embarrassingly longer than you, I think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I've come around. Oh, my gosh. Not, well, on, not start... on the AI piece yet. But, oh, yeah. but I started using an IDE. Yeah. Um, and... Like, uh, I mean, this is years ago, but uh-huh. now my life is dependent on the IDE. I can't write code in VI anymore. I and so just be, why would you? The IDE is there to help you. It's and it's yeah. going and it's showing you all this stuff and doing. It's like, oh yeah, once you see that, you go, oh well, this is obvious. Why why did, why haven't I been doing this the whole time? <laughs> yeah. So, but what's fascinating, I'd like to hear your thoughts on as you're you're exploring this. Is it seems we are entering the industry is entering this phase where the languages and the tools are all kind of co-evolving in a way that is helping us to get to higher productivity, higher reliability in a way that we were not able to do before these things were co-evolving together. And I, I think like being Kotlin, you know, centric now the where I see this a lot is, is that they they very intentionally think about the ID experience as they're working on language features for Kotlin. Sure. For Kotlin. Oh yeah. And so the, there's this connection between the tooling mm-hmm. and the language, and that it makes it really nice. It makes it really nice. Yeah. You get this really great experience. Yeah. It just makes it a pleasant experience rather than a struggle, mm-hmm. which is it, it almost brings back the joy of programming and the joy of coding. 
because you have this symbiotic relationship between the IDE and the language development. And the fact that these can co-evolve means that you can get those innovations immediately and, and utilize that to make yourself a better programmer, your code better and enjoy it a lot more, I think. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's really nice. Yeah, just the support it gives you. You can you can kind of say, "Oh, I think maybe it does this," or it'll you know it'll allow you to generate um, code for things that you wouldn't you know you don't necessarily remember, but you know you need <laughs> stuff like that. Yeah, it's... I should try Copilot and see see how how it does. Yeah, me. assuming um, that their AI, I'm sure, will be. Uh, key piece to this continued mm -hmm. co-evolution of tooling yeah. and languages and well and all these things <laughs> allow us to move up a level which i started in assembly language so i know the <laughs> desire to oh my up. gosh i have to write all this <laughs> stuff by hand whereas c will do it for me c plus plus will do things job you know and it just and it's like every time it makes us more powerful and we mm. don't have enough programmers so that's uh, what we need to do is make each programmer a lot more powerful. Mm. And I think it's almost like this, the, the tools also, I think, make us better programmers in terms of by suggesting something, they are the thing asking you why. Like mm. they present you with that choice of, here's a suggestion. Why would you either use it or not use it? And that in itself is making you a better programmer in terms of, yeah, that's a good question. Like, should I use this? Is this the best thing to be using? Um, it's a good suggestion. Where does it come from? So it's almost bringing that why to the surface more and more, I think, as we go along. Yes. yes. I do like in IntelliJ when, when I've written some code and then IntelliJ was like, there's a better way to do this because yeah. it's teaching me that, oh, like here's you you've done things maybe in the way that made sense to you but here's a better way and mm -hmm. that's probably a, a a key part of how we continue to evolve our consciousness of yep. how we write code is to ha is to be taught as we're actually writing the code well mm -hmm. i think it's very similar the very first I'd say instances of this with spelling checkers. And my friend <laughs> Daniel was a terrible speller and he goes, I don't care about spelling. Spelling's stupid. I'm not just going to worry about it. But I think it was because every time, you know, there was a wrong word, it was, you know, an emotional hit. And so he just didn't want to deal with that. And then spelling checkers come along and they just go, yeah, I, there's no judgment here. This is, this word is misspelled and I'll give you the correct spelling. And a lot of people were going, oh, people will become terrible spellers now. But he became a really good speller because he was he, being taught it, gently. Mm, he yeah. was being taught gently and non judgmentally. And I think the same thing happens here. Whereas if you go, well, you know, using objects is stupid, you should use functions. Well, that's not going to fly very well. But if it's going, hey, I can show you how to use a record here instead mm. of, you know, the classic object thing. Yeah. Well, that would be a that'd yeah. be a wonderful tool. Yeah, yeah. The gentle, non-judgmental mm -hmm. guiding of tools to better ways to write mm -hmm. code. That's There's another presentation. Good, for you. good title there. Yeah. <laughs> the gentle, non-judgmental. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Rather than for dummies. The, the, yeah, yeah, that seems harsh. Yeah. Although that resonated with a lot of people, they go, "Oh, yeah, I don't understand this. I'm a dummy, so I'll take yeah. it." Yeah. Yeah. Yep, yep. I feel like a dummy a lot when I look oh. at the code. Still? Yeah. But all, after all this time, you should. I was about to say. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah. I think it's that that people need to hear more of is people in those you know positions yeah. where you guys have been using these languages, these tools for God knows how long, you know, whatever it might be, having newbies come in and hear that, you know, you, you still question yourself, you still feel like a Terrible. dummy, whatever it might be, yeah. is really refreshing to hear. Well, and just understanding that that's not a, I don't know, this or that thing. It's just a baseline. We're yeah. scientists. We don't understand. We, we know that the world is far more complex than we'll ever be able to understand. And that's just the way it is rather than, mm -hmm. oh, no, uh, I don't understand this thing. That's a fundamental uh, flaw. Why are you so flawed? Exactly. Yeah. That, that shows how, how incompetent I am as a human being. It's like, no, no, it's just nobody understands this stuff, even people who do understand it, 
typically only understand an aspect of it. And that's just the way it is. Get used to it. I mean, that's, this is why the physics background was helpful because I was not a good physics student. I was (laughs) just like, ah, you know, I was thrashing, but then when you are used to that or you go, oh yeah, that's just a way to be. And you go into computers and it's like, oh yeah, there's a bunch of stuff I don't understand. And it's probably okay. stuff that nobody's explaining and they probably don't understand it. <laughs> yeah. And then you're, but you're right. You're absolutely right. Everybody who's coming in needs to know that as yeah. a, yeah. it's like, nope, you're not going to understand things. The best you can do like you did is start by drilling down into something and getting local um, what do you call local mastery mm. and the experience of mastery, I think is key. It's like, oh, it is possible to really understand one thing. Now I can yeah. go to another thing. And the more you do that, the more you are able to achieve mastery because you, you get you better. You know the process. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, completely. Yeah. Um, what's yeah what's next what's uh so so you're exploring tools and and yep. uh how they can be helpful is that have do you have any insights yet on that or are you just <laughs> starting that journey on. yeah exploring different tools um i'm writing a couple of like blogs and things and and uh and just articles around the different tools um but yeah just sort of exploring the next iteration the next innovations in java and things like chikati 10 my profile 6 is coming out um Things like Cryu technologies, that was kind of interesting. Um, what was it? That's Cryu, if you've come across it. I don't know. Uh, checkpoint, I'm going to not remember this acronym now. Checkpoint initiation something something, C-R-I, U or U-I, U-I. Okay. Um, and it's a tool that's being developed that basically enables um, Java to utilize snapshots so that it can start up in much, much quicker um, startup times, uh, cool. very similar to sort of if you were looking at serverless, for example, that similar right. sort of startup times. Um, like, so within like open and the and state on. of the JVM. And yes, so you exactly. Can, you can like resume from that snapshot. Oh, it's yeah. almost like um, a continuation. I don't think I knew that. Well, I mean, you yeah. know, the way a continuation is, is kind of a function that can suspend itself. Ah, and then yes. when you go yeah. back to it, yeah. it's just right where it's, it was. It's there for you. So, you yeah. know, there's no VM level continuation. Yeah, right. right. Yeah, exactly. And so this is what that's trying to enable. Um, so you have right. this sort of, yeah, this this ability to be able to go back to where you were without having to have it up and running the whole time. Without um, having to rebuild the entire cow. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay. So you, you were back to these the cows. Cow, they're important. Put the cow to sleep. <laughs> and then Bring just wake it up. <laughs> Um, yeah, gonna, so I'm looking into that. We're going to run with nice. this biological analogy. Yeah, <laughs> go there are some people that are, <laughs> yeah, there are some people that are offended by the use of cows in in this metaphor. Because, we we apologize yeah. to the vegans in our audience. Yeah. <laughs> well, people care about cows. Like cows well, are animals, and, and the so, environment, yeah. environmental mm-hmm. damage that cows do. Yeah, yeah. I wonder if anybody's yeah, de- a divisive species. I think. Okay. What? A divisive species. That's like Marmite. I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see, can we use tofu? <laughs> tofu. <laughs> Somehow. Everything is problematic. But yeah, 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 that's true. All models are wrong. Yeah. Some are useful. Yeah. All right. Well, anything else, Grace? No, no. I, it's been great joining you guys. Thank you for yeah. such a great conversation. Yeah, it was super fun. Thanks for yeah. joining us. <laughs> yeah, and we'll try and see if we can uh, get you to the winter tech forum this year yes as soon as i figure out when it's going to be yes (laughs) that small little detail (laughs) yeah yeah Yeah. all right well thank you so much grace have a good one thanks so much bye